Right now, we are in partnership with the Gullah Geechee Heritage Corridor, which you can see their icon there. Let's welcome our guests, and I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves, tell where they're from, what they're working on, and what's going on. I'm going to start with Ms. Tania Kuntz. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shelly. I am so glad to be here and participate in this conversation. Just a little bit of information about myself. I have been doing genealogy since 2004, inspired by information that my grandmothers would share with me. My professional career is in information and knowledge management, where I work for a major academic medical center. And what's been cool is that I've been able to apply the skill sets in my professional career when it comes to information retrieval, organization, summarization, dissemination, to my hobby of family history and genealogy. They just go hand in hand. My family is from Eastern North Carolina, both my maternal and my paternal sides trace to Eastern North Carolina. And one of my mother's lineages is in Columbus County, which is down in that lower uh, southeast corner of the state in the low-lying low lying areas. And I volunteer through the genealogy community. I am a member of the executive committee for the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society. I volunteer with the U.S. Gen Web Project. And I co-host the show with my colleague and pal, Renata Yarbrough Sanders, called Let's Talk North Carolina Genealogy. So I'm excited to participate and learn as well as our attendees today and share. Thank you, Tania. We're so happy to have you here. Vicki McGill. Good afternoon. A genealogy buddy here. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I am very pleased to have been invited to participate in this as well. Um, I am actually from Washington, D.C. I'm the first generation out of South Carolina. So I'm both parents from South Carolina, mainly researching the areas around Newberry and Williamsburg County. The interesting thing about researching Williamsburg County is there are so many people who migrated out to other places that you can run into anyone from any other part of this country in some kind of way links back to Williamsburg County. Yes. I've been researching, I first started with a project in high school back in the 80s. And then once things started coming online, I really got into it again in around 2008. Um, I am a member of the Washington, D.C. chapter of AUGS, the James Dent Walker chapter. And I am willing to help people get started and work on brick walls. Thank you. All right. Thank you for being here. I'm going to go down to Tendaji. If you'll introduce yourself and tell where you're hailing from and what you're involved with. Awesome. Thank you so much, Shelly. My name is Tendaji Bailey, and I'm the program coordinator for the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. Uh, on behalf of our executive director, Victoria Smalls, and our, our commissioner, we are so grateful to be in partnership um, with the International African American Museum to help facilitate and co-host some of these um, genealogy workshops during the month of February. I'm, I'm currently in Beaufort, South Carolina. If you were with us last week, then you would have seen that we were in Lincolnville, um, which is a town um, within Somerville, which is not close, uh, sorry, which is not far from, from Charleston. Uh, and next week we'll be down in Brunswick, Georgia. And the following week, I will be somewhere else, um, <laughs> not Beaufort, uh, South Carolina. Uh, and as you can see on the map on our on, on our logo, um, the the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor um, extends as far north as uh, Pender County, which is around the Wilmington, North Carolina area, all along the coast, down through South Carolina, down through Georgia, and ends down in the St. Johns County um, area, down in uh, in Jacksonville, Florida, mm -hmm. and St. Augustine, Florida. Um, and I get the privilege to um, travel. Um, up and down um, Highway 17 and down 95 to connect with these communities to identify um, events and programs that we can um, help create to um, preserve um, and educate the, the public within those areas. So I'm just glad to be here. I am not a trained genealogist. Um, I am in the learning phase, but uh, it is a, a, a joy and a privilege to, to be on the panel with you all. Well, thank you for that. And I will say we welcome your questions as well. Okay, not just from the audience. If you have questions, go ahead and speak up. Now I'm going to turn it over to Miss Tony Carrier. Welcome, <laughs> Tony. 
Hello, thank you for inviting me today. I'm pleased to be here. I'm Tony Carrier, Director of the Center for Family History at the International African American Museum. So I work side by side with Shelley in the Center for Family History. Um, before I've been with the museum for seven years now, uh, started with them as a consultant in 2016 and um, then came on staff a couple of years later. And uh, it's really been a joy and a pleasure developing this center. Really excited to get it open. And, um, and so the public can come and begin enjoying the resources that we'll be offering. Um, we're very pleased to be in partnership with the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor in uh, many things that we do. And I'd also like to welcome today, who I see in the chat, uh, Tom Reed, who is uh, from Family Search. He's, he is a genealogical officer at Family Search. And I'd like to say that we are pleased to be in partnership with Family Search as well. So welcome, Tom, to, um, to the chat area. Um, before I did this, I had Low Country Africana which is a uh, nonprofit um, organization, research organization and free website dedicated to African-American genealogy in the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage, Cultural Heritage Corridor, uh, which Tendaji just explained to you, extends from North Carolina down to coastal um, Florida, the upper coastal Florida. So just pleased to be here today and uh, pleased to share and pleased to learn. So. And, and we're about to start rolling with that learning and education. Let me re remind the attendees, just put your questions in the Q&A and hello to Tom as well. And I'm not able to see who's in the audience there. So I'm gonna say welcome to everyone <laughs> and Family Search and any of the other partners that we are in partnership with or that we want to be in partnership with, please just let us know. Another thing, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A. We will have a Q&A time after the discussion with the panel here. So we're going to do it in a round robin fashion. I'm going to throw out some questions and, and I'll either call on someone or you can raise your hand or nod your head and say, I'll take that one and, and share this information. Our ultimate goal for the folks that are in the audience is that you have a takeaway. There is something you will glean from the discussion that will help you with research in the low country. So if it's okay, I think I'll just leave the screen up that's here. And uh, for a couple more minutes, if people are copying names or taking a picture, and I'm gonna start with the first question. What are some of the unique challenges that are faced when researching genealogy in the low country region of Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas. And anyone can go first with that. All of you have your expertise from one area or another or input or questions. So Vicki, I'm gonna go to you because you are right at the top on my side. Okay. So um, researching, researching any of our history, no matter where you're researching the challenges, you know, once you get to the point where you want to research someone who was possibly enslaved, that's when the records become more tenuous, may not exist, you know, you may hit a burned county or anything of that nature. I would say for South Carolina, some of the areas where the Freedmen's Bureau existed, the records are pretty thin. Virginia, I mean, is is a wonderful place to be able to research, but in some places in South Carolina, it's like I said, just pretty thin and kind of challenging. Well, let's bring on, let's talk North Carolina, Tania. All right. Well, you know, as Ricky said, all of our areas can have, you know, challenges one way or another. Um, I would say, okay, this so this is not specifically speaking to North Carolina, but I would say that one challenge is maybe not having social enough social context to help you in your research. And I say that from a personal experience. So 
my family is from Columbus County, North Carolina, part of my family. I did not know that was considered part of the Gullah Geechee Corridor until recently, actually. And so I feel like I may have missed out early on in my own you know, research, tapping into some of the resources we'll discuss today. So I just think that goes to show how important it is to get familiar with the areas you're researching and really learn the background and the history. Now, I hated history growing up. I've gotten more <laughs> affinity for it because of family history, but I think that was a block for me when I first started. I was more interested in that genealogical pursuit. So really getting to know the location and the areas is important um, and can help you overcome challenges that exist, like what Vicki said, with records that may not be there. Because the more familiar you become, you start to realize where you can look for alternative sources of information. So, <laughs> you know, it's, we all gonna face it and, and, you know, we do what we can to overcome it, right? Sure. Okay, Miss Tony, what are some <laughs> challenges that could be faced? And, and I do wanna say for a clarification for the audience, when we're talking nine times out of 10, we are talking about African-American mm -hmm. ancestry throughout the low country. So Tony, name some of the challenges that you know about. Well, we have some challenges and we have opportunities too. And it, it goes back as, as Vicki and Tania were saying to um, the, the um, particular uh, history, the unique history of the area. For instance, uh, reconstruction for all practical purposes started in 1862 in mm -hmm. South Carolina because of the capture of Port Royal by Union forces in November of 1861. And so um, you have, for those areas that were occupied by the Union forces, you have this tremendous uh, record set that even predates the Freedmen's Bureau. But that said, that's where most of the record is concentrated so that for Lancaster County, for instance, I think what Vicki are there like two, two records in the, <laughs> you know, for the Freedmen's Bureau in that area of the upstate. So while there's a rich record set for Port Royal, Hilton Head, um, Charleston, you know, in the surrounding area in the upstate, that can be a, a bit more, uh, 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 that can be a a thinner document trail because they didn't have as many agents and your record doesn't start until the Freedmen's Bureau does. Um, there's also, I think, a challenge with the way that the slave trade, the Atlantic slave trade was conducted here. Um, I know a lot of people ask me this question and I have to disappoint them over and over. Um, they ask, is it, is it possible for me to look at records from the low country and tell where in Africa my ancestor came from or what my, what my ancestor's African name was? And, and the, the fact of the matter is that in the transatlantic slave trade to Charleston, not a lot of that information is preserved in the surviving record. Um, I think what you find more often as, for instance, a manifest of a ship coming in in the Atlantic slave trade is you'll find, uh, if you look at, for instance, Henry Lawrence account mm -hmm. journal, where he records having received captive Africans and selling them to uh, people in Charleston, he'll put the name of the, the, the slave holder and then how many boys, how many girls, how many men, how many women are uh, on that ship or that person mm -hmm. um, purchased. And so your manifest usually li list uh, men, women, boys, girls, and uh, very rarely will you find an African name memorialized there. I think in all the records that I've read for the African slave trade to Charleston, I found one record that actually mm -hmm. memorializes the African name of a person mm -hmm. who was brought in. And I was, I almost fell out of my chair when I found that one. So that's a challenge. You know, you have this enormous trade to Charleston mm -hmm. where more than 40% of the people, enslaved people who were brought into North America were brought into Charleston. But at the same time, those records are not that kind of detailed. Right. And, and before I go to Tendaji, uh, one of the things you, you all have 
pretty much mentioned about the Freedmen's Bureau. So for the audience, if people are new to that, um, that bureau began 1865. Pretty much, we've got pre-bureau records, just like um, Tony just mentioned. There's also pre-bureau records for Mississippi, Louisiana, and Fort Monroe, Virginia. So there's also some. Where do you access these records? Ancestry, Family Search, or the National Archives. There is 3.5 million records available for all of you to have fun and dig and dig. And again, you can access them online. And also, the time frame is really 1865 to 1872, but there's also some records and schedules that go to 1878. So if you hear that time frame, just know this could be the number one source to crack that 1870 brick wall that everybody talks about through throughout the genealogy research world here is that African Americans cannot find their folks prior to 1870. That is not true. We are finding and tapping in to records and resources prior to 1870, and you'll hear a little bit more, but just know that the Bureau of Refugees, which are white people, freedmen, formerly enslaved people, and abandoned lands, Record Group 105 is available at those three places. So now I'm going to go to Tendaji. So either you're going to ask a question or you're going to contribute about the challenges. Um, I can contribute a little bit. So we had an opportunity to do some of the, the right. workshopping, some of the research um, last week in Lincolnville. And so what some of the things that I noticed um, uh, as we were doing that work is that, you know, just simple things like names were changed, um, mm -hmm. spellings were different as they were looking through. Um, there was an Osborne that was spelled as an O. And as they were looking through the records, it shifted to an A. Um, and so small kinds of uh, adjustments will have to be made in, in your research and your technique um, as you're trying to identify um, your ancestors in, in that process. So that's the one thing that I, I, I wanted to, um, <laughs> to be able to- Excellent, excellent point. And, and again, some of us have been doing this a long time. We just say spelling don't count. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> just and sometimes right. our names it don't. doesn't. And and there's a corollary to that. Nothing in the Low Country is pronounced the way it's spelled. <laughs> right. so, I'm learning that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So you have you have to just as Tendaji said, you you have to search. You know, phonetically, basically, like yeah. okay, uh, F E N W I C K. How would you think that would be pronounced? Fenwick. Fen Fenwick. Fenwick, it's Fenwick or Phoenix oh. or Finnick, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or I've even seen it Phoenix. Um, how about H U G E R? Auger, Auger, A U G H U G. But I'm saying Hugie with two E's at the end instead. Yes, Hugie yeah. with two. So uh, uh, M A N I G A U L T. You would think that's Manigault, mm -hmm. right? Yes, and Manigault. that's what I say all the time, and it's not. It's Manigault. It's Manigault. It's Manigault. 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 <laughs> so if you're searching phonetically for Manigault, try typing in M A N I G O. Because remember, <laughs> that census takers wrote what they heard, heard and some yes. of the people may not have been from here. Yes. <laughs> and, right. and another good point. I'm going to say African Americans were basically had to rely that the information that they gave at the hands of that census taker to put it down there. So that gives us the tip to say the census might not be correct. Mm -hmm. It could have spelling errors. And also in those earlier years, you don't know who provided the information that does end up on the census. So it's really critical to understand that you need to know the columns on the census to help find out what's the next step for you to do in your research to resolve either the spelling areas, era or their age possibly. It might even be race. 
Maybe you're seeing somebody listed as a mulatto. Maybe you're seeing everybody listed with a C or BL or B, you know, and you want to resolve because maybe the next census 10 years later, it says something totally different. So again, look for those clues because they're going to have, we, we will have challenges. I'll just say it that way. Yeah. We're going to have them. It's okay. Just accept them and keep going. And I always tell myself, this is going to make me a better researcher. Every Absolutely. I come across. You know, I have something to share and it, sure. to highlight what Tony was talking about, with the, the spellings. You know, when, when people say to me, they cannot find their ancestor in the census, right? They've done all the searching, all the variations. I tell them, start browsing page by page, right? Yeah. Go yeah. to the district, go to the community, browse page by page. Not a lot of people want to do it, but sometimes you have to do it. You might see yeah. something that's not picked up in the indexing. That's awesome. very true. I mean, mm -hmm. for part of my family, I knew my family. My father's family was in King Street or around King Street. I went page by page. <laughs> Here they are. The census taker has given them a different surname. Yeah. <laughs> or, or the transcriber may have given them a different surname. So the census page will show you the correct information, but the transcription is yeah. totally had a bad day. Yeah. They just had a bad day. <laughs> so great, great tips on that, you know, and again, so we want people to make sure they're aware of that. So the next question I have for all of you is how do different state and local laws in records availability in these regions we're talking about affect your genealogy research? Tania? Right. I have a really good example I'd love to share from North right. Carolina. Can I share my screen? Yeah, of course. Let me All stop right. sharing. So when you we're, if you're researching a person who was enslaved or formerly enslaved, one of the record, one of the laws that's important to know about is that in 1866, North Carolina passed a law requiring those who were formerly enslaved to go report the cohabitation. And so we end up with these cohabitation records across the state. They're not available for every county, but they're available for several. Um, and I want to share, I'm going to share my screen. This is a cohabitation record from Co um, Columbus County in North Carolina, where some of my ancestors were from. And so what the couples did is they would go to the courthouse and say, you know, this is my name and this is my partner and we've been cohabitating for X number of years. So in the red box are my ancestors, William Robeson, and Rebecca Toon, and they reported in 1866 that they've been cohabitating since 1855. So they didn't have a marriage record when they cohabitated, but they were able to get it recorded after the fact. And now I know that that's when they started their union as a couple um, was in 1855. So knowing that these records exist is incredibly helpful. And I learned about these from um, Barnetta McGee White's book, Somebody Knows My Name. She had gone through and written every single, captured every single name from all the extant cohabitation records that are available. Fabulous three volume set book. Now these are available online for us at Family Search is where I, I tend to go for these. Um, I think they're also an ancestry, but these cohabitation records are invaluable. So it's definitely important to know about them because you'll get I had one branch of my family where it actually said they who was their enslaver as part of their cohabitation record. So that's awesome. That knowing is, about that 1866 law is a very helpful um, tip and strategy. And a highlight on the side of there in the Freedmen's Bureau, depending on what record you're looking at, you might see the former slaveholder's name yeah. as well. Yeah. That's another gold mine. Anyone else want to comment about the local laws and records? I would say for every state, um, no matter where you're researching, <clears throat> excuse me, if there was enslavement in that state, you need to know what the slave codes were. Yes. The different states, they were enacted at different points in time, and they had different limitations on what people could do. Absolutely. Right. And those laws generate record sets. Yes. Too. Like, um, for instance, after the the Denmark uh, uh, Easy. Easy, uh, yeah, uprising in uh, 1822 or attempted uprising, um, the the laws became stricter and stricter, um, cracking down on enslaved and free people. 
and what they could do and what they couldn't do. And also, for instance, there was a law that was enacted where you had to demonstrate that you were free, that you were born free, and that you had to make a petition with the court to say, I am the daughter of this free woman, I who was the daughter of that free woman, who was the daughter of that free woman. And the resulting record set, of course, is something that you can mine. So it's, it's very important to know the local laws and codes, particularly concerning African-American um, enslaved and free people, for sure. And, and a great point here, um, for those that aren't aware of the Midwest African-American Genealogy Institute, Track 1A talks about public records in the law, slavery laws, and they walk you through in that course. It's uh, Judy G. Russell, the legal genealogist who has a blog site, and she walks folks through in those classes on the timeline of the laws as they get created, not just Virginia, not just the Carolinas, overall. Because if you realize also that a lot of the laws started from the Brits per se, and then as the colonizers come in, the states come about this, that, and other, they take their root from there and then build their laws out. I'm saying it kind of general. So you can look at the basis, start with the state you're looking at, but also compare the states that are around it and check and see what connects. If you are looking at border counties, make sure you're hopping into that other state and seeing if your folks are there and also knowing that law. Tendaji, did you want to add something? Well, not nah, not in particular, but I um I am from the Port Royal Sound area, and so our family has had access to um, records, and so we've actually been able to um, go back as far as uh, eighteen twelve, I believe, mm -hmm. um, to identify um, our ancestors who were enslaved, and we have the plantation site and all those kinds of things. In fact, we are currently living still um, on uh, acquired land. Um, that we formerly labored on. So um, we, I'm in a very particular um, great position to like identify things and I hope that other people have um, opportunities to have that level of um, knowledge as well. Another good point before the question, go local, start local. We'll Don't gonna... start online, <laughs> right. start local. Find that county that you're looking for in the state exhaust what is at the local level. The teacher hat's coming on now. And the reason I say that is because everything that's in these databases that we access online and love and live by daily came from the local level. Right. Right. That means family search, ancestry, whoever it was, whatever database, somebody came into that local courthouse county church or whatever and scan copied or whatever it is and put it online exhaust your local level first and also find out if there's any genealogy groups going on you know right. or the historical societies and things like that this is who you would like to join based on what you're hearing today again everybody's got a component of local in their research vicky did you have something you wanted to add to piggyback on um, what Tony said about the Denmark VC um, mm -hmm. uprising impacting laws, things that happen outside of this country also impacted uprisings in Haiti, Barbados, yes. mm -hmm. Jamaica, and other places. Once word got back, then they wanted to make sure that it didn't happen here. Yes. The laws yes. changed and strengthened. So also for the attendees, watch your Q&A question. People are posting links in websites you know they're they're there i saw tom posted some and some other folks things that we're mentioning and thank you to those in the, in the q a there that are posting those so make sure you grab those links also for yourself and i'll be sharing a document that tony put together a little bit later and you'll see a lot of these links and we will have that email to those of you that were registered you will get that um, handout there. Tendaji? Yeah, um, 
Uh, just to piggyback off of you earlier about local uh, exhausting those resources, a lot of the local libraries, as I was trying to market out um, this uh, this genealogy workshop, so then they have um, genealogy um, workshops within their own um, uh, spaces often, and so you know I would check out um, what's available within within your your area. Absolutely, great point. Next question. Everybody's going to have something to say about this. How can one find information about an ancestor who was enslaved in the Low Country region? Who's first? <laughs> All right, Tony, you get it. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. I oh, yeah. Right there. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, some of the records, I mean, it's the same records that that uh, uh, the document an enslaved person uh, anywhere, not particular to the low country, but, um, but uh, so uh, probate records, um, bills of sale, uh, antebellum records, such as plantation journals, um, manuscript collections for families uh, that are preserved in local archives, of course, public records, um, but the, the thing that's, that's uh, most important in that whole process is that you work back to discover the name of the former slaveholder. And that's the hurdle that so many people um, never quite overcome is identifying that former slaveholder. But once you have identified that former slaveholder, there's a pretty rich rec record set in the low country for enslaved people. In your low country, Africana has some good resources on there mm -hmm. as well. Uh, Tania. Yes. Yeah. So to add to that, um, as Tony was saying, finding the name of your enslaver can be challenging. One tip that I often suggest is, you know, you can use like the 1860 and 1850 slave schedules and get familiar with the names of mm -hmm. the people who were enslavers. Because, you know, while we often say, you know, look for someone that has the same last name, we know that's not always true. But if you become familiar with the names of the slaveholders in your specific area, you may see names as you're doing your own family research that may clue you in to who a possible slaveholder could be. So getting familiar with some of the larger slave owners, um, and it's not, again, to browse the actual page by page, those, those slaveholding censuses are not very extensive. There's only like, what, three, four, five names on a page usually because the, the number of individuals that they were enslaving could be high. So it's easy to browse those pages and get familiar with the names of those enslavers. There are transcri transcriptions where people take a whole county and list the slave owners for a county. Um, so get familiar with those names because you're going to keep those in the back of your mind as you're working on your family tree. And that record set you noted was 1850 and 1860, and 1860. federal population slave schedules and the enslaved are noted by their gender, their age, and their color or their race. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Vicki. United States colored. <laughs> your ancestors who served in the Civil War. If your ancestor served and applied for a pension, if you are able to obtain that record and those records are housed at the National Archives in Washington, DC, some, of our, some are in St. Louis, but most are in DC, um, obtaining that record can provide you a wealth of information. Sometimes the enslaver is there, most times information about their family members. Um, who their parents were, who their brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, other people who served with them, locations, the enslaver, you know, their children, there is a wealth of information in pension records. And that's next mm -hmm. Saturday's right. panel discussion yes. <laughs> is on the United States Colored Troops. So make sure you guys register for that. Anyone and else? One other that? thing I'll oh, say, the museum's website has a lot of pension records. I was going to give it to Tony. <laughs> oh, it, it, you know, if nothing else, if you've never looked at a pension record, go there and download a pension record and look at it. And that'll give you an idea of the information you could glean from one. That's one of right. our prized possessions that are be coming out and people have access to right now. There's actually 150 U.S. Colored Troop Pensions online at the Center for Family History's website. But I do want to throw the flag up and say the Center for Family History website is being merged to the main website. 
and that is happening. So right now it is still available. If someone wants to put that link in the chat, it's cfh.iaammuseum.org and it will get you right there, okay? And, and it needs to go in the Q&A part. All right. So anyone else want to comment here? If not, I'm going to go Actually, to the next question. There's one more resource I'd like to mention for North Carolina sure. specifically, and that's the People Not Property Slave Deeds Project. Uh, um, they're yes. going through and capturing and digitizing and transcribing slave deed records in Brunswick County um, down that lower southeast corner of North Carolina. Their deed books are almost done. So if you have anyone from Brunswick County, definitely go search that database. So they, um, it's a very good resource to help you, uh, you know, learn more about those that were enslaved. So it's people, not property. Yes, that's a great also, project. And I'm, oh, well, I'm sorry. I want. I was going to, no, I was going to say also uh, here in in the Beaufort area, they've been able to um, gather some of the Freeman Bank records, and so mm -hmm. you have family members who have applied um, to have an account with them. Um, those records have uh, been preserved and and are accessible. Awesome, and and I'm actually going to come back to Tania because I would like you to share. Since we're talking about low country, let's talk North Carolina. I mentioned it a little bit before. There was an excellent um, session last week, Sunday. And if you will tell a little bit more, because- That segues into the next question. Yes. So if you will share that. And, oh, and my goodness. I think Karen Kay is there. And if she'll put that link to the YouTube yes. for there, I'd appreciate that. Let so me ahead. tell you. So- I think your next question was going to be about how do you trace ancestors with Native American ancestry? In the low so, country. In the low country. So let me tell you, last week we had as a guest, Dr. Arvin Smallwood, who is at North Carolina a and He gave a fantastic presentation where he outlined the complete almost evolution in history of Native American groups across you know, North Carolina, and even, you know, in the low country areas of North Carolina, it was fantastic. We learned about their, their laws, how their, you know, cultures were set up, their civilizations, the different groups, um, where they were at in North Carolina, what kind of records are available. It was a fountain of information. It was overblowing. It, it was, was it overblowing. Was. So we're going to, we put the video, the video is available on YouTube. So yeah, Karen K, if you're in the chat, please share that. Because and that was part one. That was part one. Yes, we are bringing him back for part two. So if anyone has Native American ancestry, this is an important presentation to listen to because you will really get a good overview of con a context of the Native American groups in North Carolina, even down in you know, the Cape Fear Valley area. So yeah, it was excellent. <laughs> and, and what I will say, we're now talking about 1619 and coming forth. Keep, keep that in mind. We're not talking about 1619 in Virginia and going forth. And remember, parts of North Carolina were also Virginia, mm -hmm. but we're talking about prior to yes. 1619, 1607 in the foundings of Jamestown. Just know there were African Americans mm -hmm. here. And we're talking about not in the hundreds, but we are talking about in the thousands. thousands. And he and his <laughs> research and other doctoral students over the years, I met him several years at an Asala conference and the students were um, sharing all of their research. And it was like, wait, nobody told us. That. Wait, there's 15,000 in Florida in the 1500s? Uh -huh. Yes, under Spain rule. So again, understand, tap into that resource, join that webinar, and they specifically <laughs> cover North Carolina. North Carolina, yes. Any yeah. other, that, that's our clue for the Native American, <laughs> yes. unless someone else <laughs> has something to respond to that. So um, I would, I would just say one ahead. thing, knowing what Native American tribes were in your state. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We all have that story about grandma such and such was Native American or part Native American and things of that nature. But to pinpoint that, knowing who was in your state, because some people say, well, yeah, she was Blackfeet, but Blackfeet wasn't in that area. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but right, exactly. But there are people who believe, yeah, they said she was this or she was that. But yeah. there are resources online that will tell you who was in what state and who, and, and when. Right, exactly. Who got moved out to Indian country and Oklahoma and all of that? 
but who was who was originally in your state is a very important piece to work through. Which brings up a quick aspect, and I'm doing a little diversion of our questions, is oral history. Mm -hmm. Let, let's everybody talk in and I'm going to go to Tony. Let's talk about that oral history that could be coming through generations, coming through the family, even the question on the Native American or, or anything that could be coming down. What is the value and what would be a good way to look at oral histories that we've heard and what challenges we might also experience trying to track and validate oral history trying to document the oral history um there's always going to be some degree of variation from from the remembrance in oral history to the actual documentary record um but i think in general for african-american research oral history tends to be at least in my experience of what I found, pretty resilient and pretty and pretty detailed as well. Like, uh, for instance, our research assistant at, at the center, Darius Brown, um, he, the reason he has been able to conduct genealogy research for the last 15 years as successfully as he has on his family is that he knew his great grandmother. Yes. And she told him which plantations their family was was it were enslaved on, and he was able then to go you know and take that to the record. There's always going to be some variation because people either misremember or as the story is passed down, it gets uh, changed a bit. But yeah. uh, but I think for the most part with African American um, oral history because it's there is such a reliance on oral history, mm -hmm. it tends to be more resilient and, and, and I find a bit more accurate, really. Absolutely, anyone else wanna chime in on that, on oral history? I would say there's always that grain of truth somewhere in it, so thoroughly research it and ask, especially older family members, do you have any documents they may, that may help support this, like a family Bible or any other documents that may exist in that home repository yes yes and something yes. else i would say when an old person dies don't let somebody go in there and just throw out everything oh. <laughs> and it happens <laughs> it does happen. and it happens if you can be there you know or if you have the opportunity to have somebody ship you stuff you pay for the shipment or whatever do whatever you can to preserve the papers and things of that nature that that older person had in their house, because there may be some wonderful gems in there. And, and you know what might not be a document, it might be a photograph. Yes, and it right. might be a picture that you don't know who it is, but because of what they got on, and whatever the location might be, might help you determine something else. Right. So there's a lot of surprises and things that you can do, which leads us right into how did one research in a low country when dealing with lost or destroyed records? What is your number one tip when you're doing, maybe it's a burned county. What do you do? What is the number one tip you would tell folks to, to either use or to check out? To Nia. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to give you one guess. I'm going to give you one guess is what my number one tip is. Maybe you'll guess it. Newspapers. Yes. I love newspapers. They are such a wealth of information because when you're dealing with an area that's lost their official county records, you know, newspapers are likely another good source. And they're increasingly being, because I'll say this, the Library of Congress has a project where they've gone through and made records of every extant newspaper they could locate across the entire country. Now they're being digitized and we have Chronicling America. Um, we have sites like newspapers.com. You know, you will find mentions of vital records like marriages, births, deaths happening even in areas where the official county records are lost. Um, a tip I have when you're using these newspaper websites is Look for opportunities where you can visual, make sure you know the geographic regions that are covered. Um, okay, I'm gonna share my screen again. I like, I like And why she's pulling up share screen, don't forget the runaway ads. Yes, those runaway ads. Comment on too. that, please. <laughs> 
so so I, I should be sharing the screen. This is the yes. Chronicle of America. They have a visualization that shows you where their newspapers are that they've digitized. And if we look at a location like Savannah, for example, you can see there's over almost 5,000 digitized issues of this one newspaper. There's like five or six newspapers that they've digitized. So collectively, there are like 8,000 page, 8,000 issues of newspapers digitized for just Savannah. So when you can look at where the papers are coming from geographically, that gives you a clue of you know, where you wanna look if you're talking about this corridor for records to help you, or information to help you fill the gaps that are created when you have record loss. So my number one tip, get into those newspapers. <laughs> Newspapers.com, folks with ancestry.com, they can have uh, also a membership right into newspaper.com. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go to Tony next. What's your Antebellum, number one? Antebellum Church Records Ooh. in the Low Country. <laughs> Wonder, that's also a class you teach at Mackey. At the yes. African yes. Institute. Yes. Yes. So generally, when you have like a courthouse fire or whatever, those are government records that are burned. So if you get out of the public record sphere and go to a different type of record set, that information may be preserved there. So for the Low Country, the antebellum church record really fills in a lot of gaps, particularly for Burn counties, because in so many of the churches in the Low Country, they recorded the births, deaths, marriages, burials, um, et cetera, confirmations of enslaved people with the enslaver identified. So it will say, for instance, Adam belonging to Thomas Drayton was baptized in the church on this day, you know, and so that, and then there's another thing in South Carolina where the state archives began collecting citizens copies of records that were burned after the civil war and they have a they have a collection it's a it's a miscellaneous collection and for some areas it's scant for other areas it's better but um it's called citizens copies mm. i think is the name of it if you look in the archives catalog and those are held at the scdah in um, columbia the state archives Vicki, <clears throat> excuse me, Vicki. I would say, look at the next county over. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. when Great tip. the fire mm -hmm. happened, business did not stop. Right. So mm -hmm. if my courthouse doesn't no longer exist. I'm going next door if I have to, to make sure I do whatever this transaction is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Tindaji. Um, I don't have anything necessarily to add for, for this particular, I do have a question, but I, I will wait. Okay. For that. Well, mm -hmm. the next one I'm going to throw to you anyway, first. Okay. Okay. And that, and that is about Gullah Geechee. How do I find out if my people were Gullah? And, and I'm, look, I'm, I'm a few generations maybe before who I'm looking for. So how would I know? Are there record sets that are called Gullah Geechee or, or things like that? And all of you can chime in, but I'm going to throw it to the corridor commission first. <laughs> okay. So I am not um, aware that there would be people identified at that time specifically as Gullah Geechee people. I don't think that that term kind of emerges um, mm -hmm. uh, until, you know, after um, the Civil War. And so you would begin by, you know, identifying, you know, plantations within local areas along the coast. Um, and those people, if they were on rice plantations or and or cotton and or indigo, um, would later be called Gullah Geechee. Um, yeah. Okay, Tony. Sure, just what Tendaji said, and, you know, there's no record set that I'm aware of that's particular to Gullah Geechee people, it would be the same records that um, mm -hmm. that identify uh, anyone in any other area. Mm -hmm. But uh, his point is is so spot on that that Gullah Geechee is a designation that came later mm -hmm. in the history. You know, I have seen, for instance, um, you know, runaway slave ad that referred to someone as Gola. Gola. You know, mm -hmm. but it it you know not until Gullah Geechee was really recognized as a, as a, as a culture, a unique culture with a unique language, et cetera. You know, did the Gullah Geechee label 
And, yeah. and again, you've got the corridor, the commission, there are websites that you can go and read more about some of the traditions and also some of the local events that happen in these areas. Anyone else yeah. want to well, add? I, I, oh, go just, ahead. I, also, yeah, I also think the other thing to, to consider is just the migration patterns, right? Um, although your ancestors sure. may have, you know, emerged out of this low country area, a lot of us have moved, you know, into larger cities for other opportunities. In fact, my family's a, you know, participant in the Great Migration, um, and so you're going to find records really in a lot of different places coming out of um, emancipation, as yeah. it relates to like who's Gullah Geechee, right? I, in my mind, I talk about Gullah Geechee, the corridor, right? But I feel like you know we are in every state, right? We're all over the country, um, and so sometimes it is difficult to identify exactly, you know, if you are Gullah Geechee. But I think again, identifying uh, as close as you can within the boundary that that has been uh, established, um, but that is not the only definition of who and where Gullah Geechee people are. Yeah, Tania, you wanted to add something. Yeah. Another way to also go about it is to leverage the research of those that have been doing that work. It's interesting. I, I came across a book written by the mayor of a town in Brunswick County that he completely explored the whole Gullah Geechee history of his area and wrote a book about it. So if you're curious to know if you may have some association and you identify someone who's done that type of research in the area, you could use that as a starting point and understand the context context of you know, where your family may have lived to see if there might be some association, but yeah. leverage the work that others have done too. Yes. Vicki, anything else or I'm going to move on? You can move on. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, and we're going to wrap this up and take some of the audience questions yes. too. I want to just highlight the fact because it's such a resource and how does one access and research land records, wills and deeds in the low country region. Tony mentioned one location and that was the South Carolina, you said history and culture center or you referenced the archives. Oh, uh, SCDAH. Yeah, yeah uh, right. Um, and in South Carolina and especially in colonial times, the register of deeds here was known as the register of mean conveyance, M-E-S-N-E. And um, it, that's just what South Carolina referred to. At, uh, what, that was just South Carolina's term for the register of deeds. Normally, you know, anywhere else you just go to the courthouse and ask for the register of deeds. But here you'd have to ask for the register of mean conveyance. But you can access those locally in the courthouses. You can access the, the archived records at uh, SCDAH, South Carolina Department of Archives and History, the State Archives in Columbia. Um, you can go to the Family Search catalog and find many, 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 many uh, deed and land records for the Low Country area. In and Tania, yes, the and value North of looking at a land record and trying to find your folks, especially during colonial times. Yeah, so land records have value in that you are seeing the like you know the fan club we talk about, right? Who are you doing these transactions with? Sometimes it's with family members. You can look at the layout geographically and see who are the people around that land area because often we were still geographically located near our family members. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of value in looking at those those land records. And you know, I'll add to what Tony said, those register of deeds records in North Carolina, almost every county's register of deeds office is digitizing them. So you can access many of them online now. Um, so go to the register of deeds site for the county and see if those records are online. And a good Google search always helps. Mm -hmm. And also mm -hmm. don't forget the family search wiki, put your location <laughs> and, and Vicki, go ahead. I'll let you finish that. Right, exactly. Vicky. The family search wiki, as yeah. well as family search also has some South Carolina deeds and records on their website. Some stuff is indexed well, other stuff not so well. And when I say indexed well, I mean pictures of the index books, not you can type type of thing. So you are going page by page. But I would say going local is the best answer, especially like for Williamsburg County. There's the courthouse, which has the deeds, transactions, things of that nature. Then there's probate records, which is a separate office, but still in the same area. But I mean, you get marriage records. You get wills, 
as far as the deed side, you get mortgages, you get enslavement transactions, and those enslavement transactions can include um, marriage settlements, which is where someone um, held slaves, their daughter was getting married, and they gave her a certain number of enslaved people right. to go into her marriage with. Mm -hmm. So going local is, is, is I, I don't even have That's the That's probably our number one right. takeaway exactly. for everybody. <laughs> Make sure you go to that local area and access what's in that community. And, and Tendaji mentioned, don't forget the public libraries. We mentioned the historical mm -hmm. societies. We also mentioned the state archives, what Tony talked about. But don't forget if there's a genealogy group, find out if there's an OGS chapter for that county or somewhere in that state or who you can partner with. Get a genealogy buddy and work together. And so now, unless we have any other comments, I'm going to turn to the Q&A. And if you have one that you've already seen, you want to respond, you go first. And Vicki, looks like you got your hand up. Local museums. Oh, yes. There may be a local museum that holds history, historical information as well. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Let me, I'm oh, going to go through oh. books. Oh, yes. Yes. Books. Absolutely. I mean, whether they're on Google Books or whether it's in a library or somewhere else, there are, there are usually books that someone has written that focus on an area that you were researching. There may be plantation information. There could be in the history of that place, anything of that nature, as well as the slave narratives that well, the EPA did. Yes, in the 30s. Yes, yes. Tindaja, you wanted to add something. Well, I, I was looking through the Q&A and it was actually a question that I also had. Sure. Um, yeah, so there has always for me been hesitancy around um, the DNA testing. And I'm just wondering um, if there are like recommended, um, trusted kinds of um, organizations, businesses that are recommended for us to participate in in order to find out that level of information. Okay, I can take this one or I can hand it over to any one of you three. <laughs> you can start. Okay. Well, and this is one of the things that the Center for Family History will do is to help people understand what's out there. Mm -hmm. We're not going to interpret results for you, but we want to make sure that you set a goal for DNA testing. What are you trying to find out? What side of the family are you looking? Is it your daddy's side or your mama's side? And then they, the research assistants can share the test. Which one, which company does this, that, and the other? There's one company like Family Tree DNA that does your Y line or your M line. Daddy's line, right? My daddy, his daddy, his daddy, his daddy, or my mama. My mama, my mama, my mama. And I say it that way because this is how we will relate. And if you're looking specifically there, you're going to look at Family Tree DNA. And one of the things is when the center is open, you also see the logos because there's other companies that are out there, but we're going to help you know which one is a valid company. There are 23andMe, you got Ancestry DNA, you have MyHeritage, you've got um, the Living DNA. Mm -hmm. So there's several companies out there. And some companies like 23andMe or even African Ancestry DNA, they charge all of them charge for the kit, but what results based on your goal of what you're trying to find out, you want to be able to understand what that test is going to give you. Uh -huh. And again, some people, individuals that are, I'm going to say genetic genealogists that have a background in DNA, biology, and things like that, they help people that were adopted and things. So these are the type of resources that the Center for Family History will help people with. And I'll let anyone else <laughs> comment on anything else other than what I've said. I've listed the company names, prices all vary. There's always a sale. Right. I'll just say that. <laughs> Around Wait for some the holiday. Sale. 
around yes, some holiday. holiday. Every yes. holiday has got a sale. <laughs> Never mm-hmm. pay full price. Never pay full price. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Never pay full price. But I think there's also, let's not forget social media in the local genealogy groups and historical societies that have discussions going on. There could be DNA discussions. And I do know like Shannon Christmas, who is also one of the instructors at Maggie, um, he they teach that track on DNA. There's a beginner's track by Dr. Um, Janice Lovelace. And then there's Nika Sewell Smith and Shannon Bernice Bennett. These are others that take you through an intermediate. So that's another resource people, if they're into the DNA is to get training on it because there's an emotional side to this DNA, just like uh-huh. it is researching our enslaved ancestors so you want to be prepared it might be that you want to prepare your family because sometimes these results will come back and it's not as you know or what you know or what the family knows so sometimes i know uh, another uh, genealogy group of family the elders in the family basically made the decision if something comes back we're all still family. And right. and there could be things that people don't know. And I'll give one example, and then I'm going to pass it on, is that my name is Shelly Viola Murphy, and I'm not a Murphy. Thank you, DNA. <laughs> now, that's all I'm going to say from there. So anybody else have a comment? And I'm going to go through some of the questions. I would just emphasize what you said about being prepared for finding out something that you did not expect, as well as figuring out, you know, especially if you did a test for someone else, Mm -hmm. figuring out, wrapping your mind around how -hmm. you're going to share that information, how much information you're going to share, or whether or not you're actually sharing that information. Mm -hmm. Because if it's your ancestor, if it's your ancestor, your elder that's in their 80s, and they've lived their whole life believing one thing, how is knowing this other information going to impact them and the rest of their life? Pie ain't pa, my ain't ma. Brothers and sisters might not be brothers and sisters, or they might be what you call half. And, mm-hmm. and so I'm going to throw a question from Miss Robinson. She said she's from North Carolina by way of transport from Tennessee. Where can I go find out slave owner for my family? Where do I start? We gave a couple examples earlier, but if someone wants to expound on that, I'll keep going. They're looking for a slave owner. Number one, Freedman Bureau record. Number two, yeah. slave schedules. Uh-huh. Number three, who's in the neighborhood? Right. Freedman, also, Freedman's Bureau land reports. <laughs> uh-huh. They're just slaveholders. <laughs> Slave schedules, 1850, 1860. Yeah. Also, Ancestry has a community board where yes. you can type out questions. And there are other yeah. people you can type out questions yeah. and you can search answers that other people have given. Most likely there's information about the mm-hmm. place that you are researching there, as well as social media was mentioned earlier there's usually a facebook group for whatever area you are researching (laughs) Uh absolutely Uh and if there's not what should they do start one right absolutely yeah get people talking yes definitely but look for the other groups and again i mentioned let's talk north carolina you know we have these monthly webinars right now we're going to Uh, Black History Month. So every Uh Saturday we have one. Other than that, the Center for Family History at the museum has the third Saturday of the month at one o'clock. Check out, just keep in tune with the main website. And for anyone that has questions about the opening, we're postponed at the time, as most of you know, but some of them that don't know, we're hoping that comes up in time just keep watching that main website for information and if you are a charter member or looking to become a member that information is going to come through that newsletter so be there to look at the website or the newsletter for updated information on when the museum actually opens 
Okay, let's see another question. What is meant by the low country? Plantation in Beaufort, South Carolina. I'm having trouble identifying a great grandfather, Adolphus McKee. So who wants to take the description of low country? I can do that, Shelley. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's two ways you can use the term low country. Mm -hmm. um, it, if you're in South Carolina specifically, the low country is gonna refer to those coastal areas because South Carolina is divided in, from, in the, into the uplands, the Piedmont, the low country. But there's also a way of using that term to refer to the low country southeast it, that is almost specifically the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. Right. Um, so it would be those coastal areas of the Atlantic coast uh, that were typically rice growing, sea island cotton growing, indigo growing, um, where the Gullah Geechee culture uh, uh, arose or had its birth. Okay, great. So mm -hmm. Kathy Watton wanted to know about last Saturday's topic, which was African American genealogy challenges. Watch for the main museum's YouTube channel, IAAM, that will be posted up there. And welcome from Michigan. That's my home state. And let's see, and that's the same thing. Yes, all of these webinars are recorded, but also when you visit the Center for Family History, also note there's some on-demand videos that are there. Some of them will link to some of the blog articles that are on there. So just keep in tune because again, that's being merged. Okay, brick wall. I don't see a question. I just see the word expect them, enhance them, enjoy them. That's all I can say. <laughs> uh, let's see, how do I get more information about my genealogy from up north? Go for it. Anybody? They just and want to know, this is Diane. She wants to know how can she get more information uh, about up north and I'm going to assume up north is like where I just said I was from Michigan and and that's what I was on but it might not be it might be further <laughs> North Carolina I don't know I'll go to the family search wiki first right. yes anytime yeah. you're researching an area that you're not familiar with go straight to the family search wiki because it's your encyclopedia <laughs> and I mean when you go particularly if you search on a, a, a state if you search on a, a state and a county or if you search on a state um, you're going to get links there to, to resources specific to that area, including contact information for the courthouses, everything. So a good way to determine what's out there for any particular area is just go straight to the Family uh -huh. Search Wiki. Absolutely. And, and I know there's links that are in the Q&A box going through there. And uh, Tom Reed had posted also a link to uh, the Freedmen's Bureau collection also in there. And we have people from all over the United States. And it's I'm really excited about that. I'm seeing Alabama. I'm seeing Delaware. I'm seeing Michigan. It's unbelievable. Okay. Rebecca says, my father, you see it? <laughs> I see it. I see it. I was going to say, I want to answer this. I want to. You got it. It's going right to you. All right. Rebecca or Rebecca Koontz Butler. Hey, cousin. Okay. I don't know if we're cousins, <laughs> but I love that you're also a Koontz. So Rebecca asked that she says her father, uncles, and grandfather are from Columbus County in North Carolina. And her grandfather had the Koontz drugstore in Chadburn. She, so she says, as a white descendant, how can I get started finding my Black relatives? I know my earlier ancestors had slaves. So my first response is, if you know your earlier ancestor has slaves, you know, what record set do you know that from, right? Take a look at the record set, look at the names mentioned, and then you can start looking for like the 1870 census and see if you find individuals with those names that might be nearby. Um, and again, look at the first names, look at the group of names, because maybe their last name is changed or they didn't take your family name. Um, but start to look at the names that you see documented in your own family's materials. Now, specifically for Kuntz, I have a Kuntz surname study. So I research Kuntz's all over the country. We need to connect. You need to email me, Rebecca, tania at gmail.com. <laughs> so I may have some information that can specifically help you. But as a general tip, start taking a look at 
each of those names documented and then start looking for it, black individuals with those names. And I, I wanna comment, Tom Reed posted said, get ready again. We are, as in Family Search, about to index all the North Carolina cohabitation records. Our goal is to have them fully searchable <laughs> on Family Search by April 30th. Ooh, love, it. <laughs> love it. We're gonna hold you to that, Tom Reed. Yes. <laughs> Shelly, somebody asked about, will the webinar save and distribute the Q&A from this session? Is there a way to, to save the Q&A? There is a way to save the Q&A. Good deal. Yes. Thank um, you for answering that, because I'm sitting here yes. thinking, now, I know I do <laughs> we, it on my... Because this yeah. Q&A is really good. Yeah, yeah. Yes. There is a way okay, to get so that I'm report, Shelly. So that we'll, to you, Miss Co-host. Well, you'll have to do it from your account, but we can talk about how later. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> All right, let me go through here. Okay, so Tony cleared up a huge box for uh, block for Vincent regarding their um, looks like second great grandmother and noted on the Friedman Bank record, another great source. Yeah, we've had a lot. Let's see, cohabitation records. Are cohabitation records available for South Carolina? No. I will simply Tony, say Tony, you're on mute and, and I've heard two no's. Sorry. <laughs> I was I was typing away in the chat room. Um not as a group. I mean, not, there's not like a record set called cohabitation records for South Carolina. There's a couple of marriage records that survive mm -hmm. for um uh, for South Carolina, but we are not blessed with that body of records uh like Virginia is. <laughs> Those Virginia <laughs> records have <laughs> they're, they're unbelievable. I will yeah. say that um, someone else asked that and I provided a link in the Q&A okay. for the places where they exist, because there are some other states that add them as well. Okay. So we've got another, uh, uh, and I'm going to slowly wrap this up, but there's another DNA and I'll just respond and keep going. They just said, if you want to do DNA testing, who should you attempt to get tested? Regardless, go for whoever is old on the oldest living right now in your family. And that's not just for DNA. That could be an oral history interview that Tania talked about earlier. Interview, you start with yourself, work yourself back. But if you've got elders in the family, aunties, uncles, grandparents, this, that, and other, start talking. We got these phones, record them, get their permission and interview them. Come up with a few questions, not 20, just come up with a few, three to five questions when you're dealing with the elderly. I've got a 92 year old in another room and I know if I go in there with 20 questions, she's not gonna answer them. But if I go in there with two or three good questions, then we got a great conversation going on. And again, I always ask her, I said, mom, you know, I'm gonna record you. You okay with that and get that on there. Okay, let's see. And it does matter who you test, depending on what your goal is and who you're trying to find or make a connection to. And let's see, uh, got change in names, got a lady. Um, another thing, if you're looking to hire a genealogist, there is a website and Tania, you're shaking your head. So it's Vicki, if you wanna respond to that for help, Besides OGS and joining those groups, there is a professional site that you can hire yes. a genealogist. Yes, that's the Association of Professional Genealogists. They have a directory that you can search on a number of different criteria, like languages they cover, repositories they're experienced with, different niche, you know, different specialty areas that they focus on. So it's a great directory to be able to use. Got you. Okay, so this is coming from Marilyn Campbell. Family oral history says a sec of the family of 17 children were divided and sold to somewhere in North Carolina. Not sure where. Would there be a place to search for slaves brought in from another state like Virginia? Put your thinking caps on that. I've got some ideas on this one. 
and I'm going to throw this out and y'all can respond. Reverse genealogy. Go forward and try to go back. Because you might have to go with somebody that you know now and backtrack to get that now all of a sudden they might have been raised in Virginia, but they died in North Carolina. But you see that their birth said Virginia or something like that. So you're going to have to track back and use the, the technique of the reverse genealogy instead of starting, you know, start with the ancestor or start with yourself one of the ways and go back. And um, hopefully that will help people. And anyone else just chime in with a suggestion. <laughs> I would say if you have an idea of who one of the slave owners was on either end, mm -hmm. search that courthouse because there was a transaction that allowed those people to move from one enslaver to another. And, and also I'm gonna say a, a, a tip from Virginia on the Library of Virginia site, there's legislative petitions. And we're talking about the movement, people coming in, this, that, and the other. So it could say that here comes the slave owner from North Carolina, and he's going to bring 20, 30 slaves into Virginia. They would have to petition the General Assembly in some cases. So peruse through like the Library of Virginia, peruse through what's at South Carolina archives and see if things like that are there. And I see Maggie, I see uh, Mapping the Freedmen's Bureau site. Anything else? There's a comment that Dr. Smallwood was outstanding. That will be specifically North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And okay, Tony, you answered there. Another good thing when we mention the Freedmen's Bureau is go to Ancestry and you can Google or go to YouTube and finding the lost letters of Hawkins Wilson to understand the value of what we're talking about in the Freedmen's Bureau, there's a 29 minute video on there that they did and it, and you'll hear these ancestors or descendants of the ancestors and the things that they learned. Okay, let's see, I'm going through here. Any other comments um, before we go? And I just wanna say, I'm gonna appreciate, we might not have gotten to all of the questions that are in the chat because there's over a hundred of them. And <laughs> some as two hundred that are still open, but some of them are just gone. I know, I know. <laughs> I'm trying to scan through as fast as I can, but we covered a lot. So number one, I do want to thank each of you for coming. And I'm going to give you the opportunity to share one last comment or tip before we go away. And then I'll say thank you to everyone. Stay tuned to the main website as far as the International African American Museum, the next events that are coming up that I talked about in the beginning, and that recording will be up. And again, Tendaji, thank you for being our partner. We still got a couple more weeks to go and, and things. And just so you know, some of these are being aired in local public libraries that they're tuned in and also watching our webinars. So Vicki, party up, words. Brush up on reading cursive writing. Oh, <laughs> good one. Because a lot of records are handwritten and cursive writing is not necessarily something that's been taught in recent years in public schools, probably in private schools either. So I would say spend some time, if you're doing this research, spend some time looking at records and figuring out what something says. And one way to do that is as you're reading, transcribe it, mm -hmm. type it out, mm -hmm. and then keep looking back and forth. And if you can't figure it out, ask an older person in your family or somebody you know in your neighborhood or wherever what this says and usually older people and i mean older people as young as 40 maybe to help you with reading this document and don't forget they can always post it on facebook in yeah. that county genealogy group and say help what is this tania Take advantage of our state library and archives. Mm. Really get to know the staff there. <laughs> they are going to be wonderful resources for you. Get to know the collections. Um, the more you can acquaint yourself with what's available at that level, the better it helps you in your research. 
and I'm biased. My background's in library science. So hey, I have to say <laughs> from the librarian. <laughs> okay, Tendaji. Yeah, one of my uh, tips that I, I shared in, in Lincolnville is just to be patient with yourself as you're going through the research. Oh, okay. um, you're going to have to, you know, search and search and search again, um, sometimes until you're able to find anything. And so just be patient in that process. Um, but I also wanted to say thank you, Shelly. I did remember where I'm going to be at the end of the month. Uh, so <laughs> next week, <laughs> next Saturday, I will be at Fort Frederica uh, for their African American History Festival. We're actually going to have the webinar, hopefully in their auditorium, okay. uh, and hopefully have some time to do some of the family um, research um, in person. And then the following week, we will be in Conway, South Carolina for uh, the Conway Gullah Geechee Community Day at their public library as well. So if you are in any of those areas, we invite you to come see us and enjoy this webinar in person and to you know bring your laptop, bring a iPad or a smartphone so that you can get some help with getting started with this process. All right, and Tony, I am actually gonna pull up your um, handout, which will be okay. emailed. And yes. we've already aired, showed it once, and and I want to put it up again and make sure people can see it. And I will pause it so people can also take pictures of it. But I also want to say that we're going to send it out through the email list of people that registered. And you can come on this and then your takeaway for today, Tony. Okay, so there are some topic areas on this handout. Like for instance, we start with family search because we have two articles on our website that will tell you how to find every record that's digitized on family search between those top two links. Uh, well, find millions of free family search records for your area of research interest. That article will take you to an article called Has Family Search Digitized the Records You Need? Here's how to check. So we start with Family Search because they're an enormous local record repository. And then from there, we move on to some of the notable new South Carolina collections that have grown out of our partnership with Family Search. These records have all been digitized since we formed our family uh, partnership with Family Search, and uh, we were able to participate in, in identifying those record sets for South Carolina that really needed to be digitized. And Family Search has taken them on and has started indexing them. So please look at those new collections. Um, the pre-1870 South Carolina records, there are records in South Carolina that fill the gap many record sets that fill the gap between 1865 and 1870 and use these records to help identify the slaveholder. If you've identified your ancestor in the 1870 census, use those pre-1870 records to see who your formerly enslaved ancestor had an association with, who are the white families they had an association with. Um, then there's the there are is a robust record set uh, for resources for the city of Charleston. Some of these are in Charleston. Some of these are on Family Search um, in the New and Notable Collection section. Then there's a section on the Center for Family History uh, at the museum. Our website, various pages and and presences that we maintain online. And then below that, I've put genealogy resources online. These are some great online places you can go to search collections. Below that, I have put um, key regional archives that uh, hold significant manuscript collections for, um, Shelly, could you scroll down just a little bit more to key, key local archives? Oh, sorry, archives. let me let me pause it right here for a sec. So if somebody's screenshotting or doing something. Oh, sorry. OK, yeah. right. So <laughs> all of these are the digital things. Yeah. These are these are our uh, big go to digital uh, uh, collections that you can go to for the low country. And then for the records that are not online, key regional archives are listed for you there with their link to their website. But one great way to search for all the manuscript collections 
that uh, concern your area of research interest is to use that archive grid, grid, which is the final mm -hmm. thing on the uh, handout there. Um, that, is an, uh, that is a catalog of manuscript collections held in archives, libraries, and other repositories. So if you're, for instance, researching the Ball family, I noticed someone in our, in our um, question and answer was, was descended from a Ball family plantation. Um, you know, you could go to Archive Grid, type in Ball family papers and see what you find for where are the various locations where those papers are held. Appreciate it. And I will say it again, since we're still recording, this document will be emailed to those who have registered. So if you are here and that's your question, how do I get a copy and you didn't take pictures, they will go back out on the email list. So you will be able to get this list. And I also will make sure it gets into the Center for Family History site. It is under emerging. And so access that take advantage of the on demand, the information that's there and um, have fun with it. Anything else before we go? If just, not, I'm go ahead. One more, just learn the record sets for your area. Oh, learn absolutely. the record set, know your records. If you, if you mm -hmm. get stuck, actually, you just need to discover a new record set. There's always <laughs> another <laughs> record. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. know your record sets. And where's the first place we can start to do that? The family, family search, search wiki. Research wiki. Yeah. Family <laughs> search wiki, but also the house repositories. Yeah. The mm -hmm. family, what does everybody got? What do they have? Are they willing to share? You don't want it because a lot of people want to hold on things. Think about this. I only want a copy. I can come with my little phone, scan it in, <laughs> take a picture and stuff. I don't want to take your original document, you know, that I'm so excited about. I just want a copy. And again, that's a good way to engage. And I'm going to give one, one thing that we didn't mention today is the youth and the younger ones that are coming up behind us. We have got to start sharing this information, share your research, get them engaged. Somebody's going to have to carry this torch. And for those of you that have children, nieces, nephews, cousins, and whatever, find one or two of them that are kind of interested in this. If not, put them on the internet and teach them how to search it so they can help you. Their minds might go a little bit faster, but engage that next generation. So, Tania, you, you got a response there because I know no, you've got no, two. No, I know a... you've got two, and I'm sure like my two, they know this oh, history. No. They might not be researching, but they can recall things that they have heard. I've so, got anyway. five, actually. Oh, do you? <laughs> so, but let me tell you, I, I, yeah, the youth, get the youth involved. They may not know it now. They may not appreciate it all now, but it'll stick with them as they get older, hopefully. Right? And also leverage their level of comfort with technology yes, yes exactly they know how to make videos they dance and all of that on this social media so mm -hmm. they know how to use the video capabilities on these devices to create something to preserve your family's history mm -hmm. and share it all right i thank you Go Sorry. ahead. What was that, Tendai? I was just I was, I was just saying, including having them do the oral history collection with their, their phones and their tablets and all those things. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you, everybody, and have a good Saturday afternoon.